Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 149, we're going to talk some more about rebased Loctals. And today, we're going to focus on rebasing the 7F7 tube, which is equivalent to the 6SL7 GT. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So, last week we talked about the amazing Newell Stock 7N7 tubes that we rebased as direct equivalents to the 6SN7 GT. GTW, GTA, and GTB. Did I get them all, Charles? Oh, I think there's also a 6SN7W hiding in there, too. Right. And even though there's almost all of the Loctals are... Um, direct equivalents. Direct equivalents. There are some that don't actually exist as Loctals. And amazingly enough, there are some unique Loctals that don't exist as Octos. Yeah. And those tubes are really exciting. Oh, yeah, and it's a really nice find. Okay. This week, we're going to look closely at the 7F7, which was, which was a Sylvania-made Loctal tube with identical electrical parts to the much-loved Sylvania 6SL7 GT. Sylvania clearly had a sonic profile that the engineers were aiming for with a warm, rich mid-range along with really good detail. These sonics I like to call the Sylvania house sound and almost any Sylvania triode will at least have some of that sound. But the 6SN7s and 6SL7s and their Loctal equivalents have it big time. And as a result, these are some of my favorite vintage tubes. Now, Charles knows more about these tubes than I do, so why don't you show everyone what we've been getting up to? Yeah, okay. So, just like last week when we took a look at the 7N7 and the rebase versions of them to the 6SN7s, we've got an assortment of tubes laid out here. And importantly, just like Dad mentioned earlier, the thing to remember is that every one of these tubes was made by Sylvania. They were made at different times and maybe in different factories, but they're all Sylvania built 6SL7 equivalents. And in fact, Sylvania, we figure, made what? At least 98% of the Loctals. They invented the type, they, yeah. they owned the rights to it. There, there are a couple of versions of Loctals that were made by, I believe, National Union and I think Kenrad uh, was, no, Raytheon was the other one. And, and in Europe, they were, there were some that were, they weren't exactly the same, but they were actually sort of backwards compatible, right? Yeah, well, I mean, Sylvania developed the Loctal base design, um, working together with um, Philips and I believe Siemens in Germany. I could be wrong about that one, though. So it was a design that was used in the UK. It was a design that was used in Germany. Um, so you, you see sort of this Loctal idea crop up in a few different places. But it really didn't take off in Europe. No, um, although we do see some tubes that are over there that are interesting equivalents, like there's an 807 equivalent in a Loctal, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, where was I here? Well, you were going to take a look at the comparison between a, st a standard Loctal equivalent and a standard Octal. All right, so let's start with this guy then. So, this is our standard late version Loctal 7F7. So this is equivalent of the last version of the 6SL7 made. It's got the angled oval plates. Mm -hmm. And the, the oval plate design uh, was one of the great early uh, inventions or discoveries uh, in, the t in the early tube era. In the first tube era is what I should say, the, the radio era. Uh, radio and telegraphy, they call it. <laughs> um, and I believe it was a German, I've forgotten his name, and he discovered that if you make the plate oval, you automatically get an increase in gain. And of course, this, the 6SL7 
it was the high gain tube of its day. Consider it an early version of a 12AX7. It was used for all the same purposes. And I think we mentioned this before, but I believe the early RCA receiving tube manuals have schematics that use 6SL7s in stages like phono preamps, which yeah. of course is what we're using it for now. Yeah, and the reason we chose it, of course, is it's it's just a lovely sounding tube. And the, even though the 12AX7 has more gain at 100, and the 6SL7 has a nominal gain of 70. Um, the 12AX7, it's, it's a very neutral, flat sounding kind of a tube. Mm -hmm. It's a very different sound to it. Yeah. And obviously we prefer the Sylvania sound a lot more. Yeah, especially <laughs> when you're playing vinyl, trying to bring, you know, a vinyl system is unique. It's, you, you just want that really lively um, kind of, um, dynamic sound that's warm it's rich it's just it's so different than a digital system so another thing that we discovered whenever we were rebasing these 6 l7 equivalents is that first of all the tube sounded amazing of course they sounded similar to their octal equivalents but they didn't sound the exact same and they also tended to be lower noise and lower microphonic and the reason for that, I think, we're not 100% sure on this, has to do with how the Loctal pin structure was made. So if you take a look at, here's a D-based tube. So we've removed the Loctal base on here to get a better look on the inside. And that's our first step at remanufacturing them. Yep. Uh, we have the same plate structure on here as, a, as an early 6SL7. But the way that the pins go through the glass is completely different compared to a 6SL7 tube. We have this long, rigid pin that starts off on the outside, but about maybe two thirds of it are inside the glass. It's thicker than what you would find on an octal, and it's definitely more rigid and there's more surface area there. So it's probably better conductivity as well. And I think this is helping to prevent vibration and it's helping to ensure that there's a better contact. So even though these pins on the outside were sort of the weak point of the Loctal tube, I think inside is where we're really seeing a benefit from them now that they're being rebased. And of course we leave those intact and <laughs> we have to, in some cases, we to actually remove a little bit of the pin. At the uh, very end. At yeah. the very end after we re-solder it. But, um, the structure in the glass stays where it is. Exactly the same. Yeah. And the bases we're using are quite lovely. We've got one here to take yeah, a look are. at. Yeah, they are. So they have solid brass pins that are gold plated. And that's becoming quite unusual these days because brass plating is uh, <laughs> gold plating. <laughs> gold is so, everybody knows gold's so expensive now. Manufacturers are actually moving away from gold plating. So um, you're getting very good conductivity. And in fact, the uh, manufacturer that makes many of our um, our adapters, our adapters yeah. recommended the gold plated brass pins. He said these will solder much better than a tin pin. And he was right. They solder in beautifully. There's a lot of solder work to doing the rebasing and a lot of it's tricky and difficult, but not the final connection mm -hmm. that works really well. And these are also the thickness or the height equivalent of the earlier tubes too, which helps us with the rebasing, but also I think it makes for a nicer looking tube and it's easier to grasp and remove from a socket. Yeah, it's got that classic vintage look. Yeah, which is great. So let's take a look at a few different versions of the tube that we have here. And let's start off with the octal version of the one we were just looking at earlier, which is the last version of the 6SL7 GT. And that's the tall boy version. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually there's an interesting point. So this is the last version of the 6SL7 that was made, but it's still called the GT. While the 6SN7 had the GT, the GTA, the GTB revisions over time, the 6SL7 stuck with the same spec. However, they did update the construction of them and likely kept pace with the specifications of 6SN7 tubes for things like the heaters, because why would they have a different production line of those heater filaments. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that they didn't change the designations to a GTA and then later on a GTB, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Because uh, we do see the same sort of variations go along as these tubes were made. So there's a, an actual octal version of the tube 
and here is our rebased version of it. Not much different, and actually they're almost the same height since our base is a little bit taller, which is pretty interesting. But the actual components inside, even the bottom mica and the top mica, are, are identical. Yeah, you can and take a look at them there. Almost certainly what happened was when they were making um, Octal, Octal 6 SL7s on the line and they had an order for Loctals, they would have taken the upper electrode components off the line and just sent them over to uh, a Locto line. Because the lower part is different, quite a bit different. Um, very different. <laughs> so where, where it was joined into the glass, they obviously had a different process for, but the rest of the construction is the same. So there's the latest version. And like with the 7N7s, we see um, some versions of the Loctal tubes that aren't quite the same as their Octal counterparts and sort of back and forth. So interestingly, this is sort of like the bad boy equivalent of a 6SL7. And it's the first and earliest version of the Sylvania 6SL7 yep. octal tube. Yep. So we have these. We have the tall bottle. We have the tall plates. All these, these ones are slightly offset from each other on a bit of an angle, and we have a, a large chrome on the bottom. There's a plate getter down here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that on camera. Just like Maybe the right bad, there. bad Boy 6SN7GTs. Yeah, so this is really similar to the Bad Boy. And actually, I think the Micas are probably almost the same too. Sonics are similar as well. It's, mm. a, it's a much loved tube. The problem with them is that they're very old now. They were made in the 1940s, early 50s. And like many high gain tubes, they tend to be noisy. If we can find new old stock versions, and it's hard to, we'll bring them in and we're trying to stay away from the used ones unless yeah. they look really young. They've got to look really good, but we still lose a lot of them to noise, unfortunately. But interesting enough, the Loctal uh, tube of the period is built like the true bad boy, the 6SN7 with back-to-back mm -hmm. plates. And you've got an example right there, I think. Yeah, right? so they sort of skipped over this angled version. They didn't make a Loctal version of that, but what they did do was make a straight back-to-back. -back. And you can kind of see it in here. There's so much chrome that it's actually difficult to make out. This is one of the ones with less chrome on it, amazingly. And I think the reason why they went with the pattern of back-to-back -back or angled is because the Loctal tube electrodes, remember there's two tubes in an envelope, are symmetrical. Yep. So on opposite sides of the pinout, there's an equivalent pin for the other tube in, inside the envelope. So what that means is that you can actually turn the tube around. Um, you can do a mirror image of it. In the circuit design. In yeah. the circuit design, and you'll have a different stage. Instead of stage one, you'll be on stage two. Mm -hmm. But you'll have exactly the correct electrode. With an octal tube, you couldn't do that. You can't do that. Yeah, they, they switched over, I believe it was the grid and the plate on one side. And so it just wasn't symmetrical, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. when they actually, I mean, the octal came first, but only a few years after the octal tubes came out, I think the Sylvania engineers decided that this was a mistake and that they, they actually corrected it. Well, I'm, I think it makes sense. If it, you're making a dual triode, why not mirror it down both sides? And even though we don't have a direct equivalent of this version, this is actually closer to sort of the bad boy equivalent, we do have these little stubby versions that came out a bit later. And you can see this one actually has gray plates instead of black. And we do have a gray plate version of this 7F7 tube, although we're, we don't have any rebase at the moment to show you. And right now you're showing a true octal version, right? Yep. This is a true octal. And look how, sh how short this tube is. It's, you know, it's about the same height as, uh, as an unbased loctal, which, you know, that's not going to help anything there. <laughs> and what do you think these tubes were used for? Well, the, generally speaking, shorter tubes uh, were called for by equipment manufacturers. So they would have um, mobile radios, for example, mm -hmm. needed the smallest tubes that they could get. And remember, going into the early years of the Second World War, nine-pin tubes were just starting to be invented. So octals and other base types that were even bigger... That was it. You didn't have any options. Yeah. So if you can make something smaller by a bit and, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it's, it's saving a bit of space. 
Now, in 1955, 56, 57, manufacturers started into a huge new area of electronics. Mm. TVs. And TVs changed the whole consumer electronics industry almost overnight. And they had problems with space and heat. So smaller tubes, um, uh, specific filament requirements, because believe it or not, they wanted to string the filaments at 120 volts AC. And that's one of the reasons why you see GTB versions of the 6SN7. It had a controlled heater warm up specifically for that purpose. So a lot of short tubes start to appear in the mid to late 50s as a result of manufacturer's requirements. Mm -hmm. And personally, I prefer the tall boys. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make a difference sonically, but man, they are a lot sexier. Well, <laughs> they do look nice, but I think there's something to be said for these shorter chrome domes. I mean, this amount of chrome on here, like that just looks amazing. I love the chrome domes too. So in fact, all of the Loctal 6SL7s or 7F7 rebase tubes mm -hmm. sound amazing. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned earlier, and I think it's worth repeating, for a high gain tube, they are surprisingly quiet. Yeah. Which f means that for the for the coming phono preamp, that's going to be our tube of choice. We're going to ship the the test builders. Almost certainly are going to get rebased Loctal tubes. We try and send the very best tubes we have, and they are the very best tubes that we have right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, how about we stop yapping, and um, and we actually listen to a couple of these. Which ones are we listening to, Charles? Uh, we're going to listen to the latest version or the later version of the 6SL7 rebased equivalent. And, and one of the first versions, right? The, the first back versions. to back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's roll. Thank you. 
Okay, wow, that's one of my favorite test tracks. That's on the CTI label, and CTI stands for Creed Taylor. Creed Taylor started this uh, label, I think, in the very late 60s, and um, he must have really cared about how his recording sounded because the studio recordings, the live recordings. Um, well, do we have two or three records that are CTI? Oh, we have more than that, but we oh. have the, the, this recording is off of the, uh, the summer jazz series in which mm. they, they only did this once that I know of. They, they made three records of one concert day at the Hollywood Bowl. It must have been, you know, an all afternoon thing. And every track is a winner on them. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they're clean, they're clear. The players are all top notch from that era. And it's just, it's, it feels like summer. It feels like festival. You pretty much couldn't ask for anything more. It's, yeah. it is great sounding. Yeah. And of course it's all analog, right? It's an AAA recording. So it went down on tape. There, I mean, there was, no digital at the time. The records were pressed from an analog source. And, um, you know, if you're into vinyl, stay away from digital records. Um, just either find an original press or deal with companies that only advertise an AAA signal chain. Mm -hmm. It's the way to go. Well, this section, we normally start talking about what's coming in. Maybe we talk a little bit about the kid ant business. Well, the kid ant business is occupying almost every hour of the day. As soon as stuff gets shipped out, as soon as orders are done, those pesky orders, we can actually get some real work done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're working, I wouldn't say night and day, but we're working every day on, on 
the line of kits because the fall is the time that people start thinking about indoors and what are my hobbies that I want to, you know, get going again for the winter. And building, building an, there's nothing like building a preamp or an amplifier and then plugging it into your system. That's uh, If you need to run a heater to keep warm, you might as well get some good music out of it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> They're not that hot. Jeez. <laughs> You're a funny guy. Anyways, um, we hope to have uh, re-releases and stock of kits and that whole thing. We're going to do a big show on that because, mm -hmm. and in fact, our 150th episode is coming. So we're charging along trying to get ready for that. And we have, I would say we have thousands of great tubes inbound right now, but the, none of them are here. Yeah, we have, we have a lot that are in the mail and it's hope, actually kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, we spent a lot of money, but we found some good deals from suppliers we trust. And with any luck, they clear customs for next Friday. And we're going to have a big show on what came in. Yeah, we'll just take the big bucket of them and dump it in front of you. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, if you stayed till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And somebody just got the big hidden code down. You can't, it's not here, but you could easily figure it out. That hurts big time. But I like to see discounts go out. I think, you know, times are tough. And if you've got... If you can figure out a discount, grab it. Absolutely. And we can reach most of you with a flat rate $20 shipping around the world. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.